And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of, of his Father with the holy angels. Now with the missions conference starting Sunday, um, the Lord led me to this passage and I want to talk to you about the value of a soul. How much is a soul really worth? Uh, of course, everybody nowadays, you know, they want to live a long life and they want to be successful and have everything that the, that the world has to offer. But uh, the word success is only used one time in Scripture, and that's in Joshua chapter 1, verse number 8. It says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So the world's got the wrong idea of, of everything here about that. Uh, they, want, uh, they want to purchase things, houses, cars, and nothing wrong with those things. But uh, that ought not to be our goal. Uh, I think about Howard Hughes, probably one of the wealthiest men of his time, uh, died and left every bit of it behind him. Uh, people will go to all kind of lengths to try to live longer, but eventually they die. And the fact that comes out is really what was that soul worth? What is a soul worth? And that's what I want us to look at tonight. First of all, uh, in understanding the value of a soul, we need to realize that there's nothing in this world that is as valuable as your soul. Your house doesn't approach your value. Uh, all your possessions, your bank account, everything that you have rolled all together uh, is not equal to the value of a soul. We need to understand, first of all, that durability determines value. Something that is durable costs more than something that is not going to last. You know, gold is more expensive than iron. Why? Iron rusts and goes to nothing. Gold stays. So value de is determined by durability. Well, let's look at our soul in that regard. Our soul is going to outlast this body that we have. Uh, Genesis 2, 7 says there that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. That soul will live for all eternity. Now, again, in chapter 2, verse 17, God told us said there, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. The body dies, the soul continues on. It lives forever. From the moment a baby is conceived, there is a new soul, and it will last for eternity. Uh, it just keeps on and on and on. And of course, in that regard, our, our soul is going to outlast this earth. Uh, in 2 Peter 3.10, it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with firm heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. But the soul keeps on. The soul keeps on. There are only two things that are on earth today that will spend uh, last into eternity. First is the word of God. God says his word will never fail. It will not, shall not pass away. And of course, the other thing is man's soul. Those two things that are on the earth will last for all eternity. Well, not only does durability determine value, but understand that uh, demand also determines value. Uh, something that no one wants has no value. 
You know, people want goals, therefore it's valuable. People want diamonds, therefore it's valuable. But uh, we're so valuable that Jesus died for our soul. It wasn't earthly value, it was heavenly value. Um, 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19, For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Hebrews 12, 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He understood the value of a soul. It was worth enough that he was willing to come and to die to redeem that soul. So a soul has value, but then we need to understand, too, the vanity of the world today. The world is, is vain. Uh, we read there in Mark 8, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Um, uh, the one that uh, has um, Amazon, um, I can't think of his name. Hmm? Bezos, worth billions and billions of dollars. He's not going to take a penny of it with him. Right. Not a penny. Uh, it's going to be left behind. Uh, it's the vanity of this world, people that they, things that they, they buy. Um, we had uh, had to be out for a little while today, and Georgine was asking me about I, I splurged and I bought a Georgia sweatshirt. Uh, that's my team. But uh, she was saying, you know, I really don't have a lot of things I spend money on. Uh, there's just not a lot of things I need. I've got clothes. I've got shoes. Uh, I've got the other things I need. It's just, you know, I'm not out there buying just to buy stuff. I, I'm trying to get away from all of that. But the world, uh, they, they want all of these things. And if you look at, at history, uh, men have tried to conquer the world just to get the possessions uh, that he could get. Uh, as you go through Scripture, there's many rulers are mentioned there in the Scripture, but the one that stands out to me is Nebuchadnezzar. And the, the kingdom that he um, had and all the possessions and everything that he had um, didn't do him any good. Uh, I think about later on, the name that came to him, it was Alexander the Great. He was a young man that conquered the known world at that time and died at a very young age. Didn't do him a bit of good. His empire was split in four parts, and they all just went, uh, went haywire. But uh, we have an example in Luke chapter 12, Jesus talking there in verse 19 and 20. says, and I will say to, or this is the, the rich man talking, I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. When, when then, who shall these things be uh, which thou hast provided? He thought he had it made, had everything built up. He had food to last him for, for years and years and years. And God says, you're a fool. You're not going to get to eat a bit of it. Uh, your soul is going to be required. Paul talks about rich people in 1 Timothy chapter 6. In verse 9 and verse 17, he says, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. People, what put... Uh, Paul is talking about is people's goal is to get rich. That's their mindset. Now, if you're working and God gives you talent and you do get rich, that's one thing. But when they set their goal, I know when we were first on deputation, we visited a church up in Sumter. Uh, there was a man in that church was in construction. Uh, 
actually was a very wealthy man. Uh, his construction money was making money just hand over fist. But you know what he did with that money? He built the auditorium for that church. He gave and that he used his money uh, for the Lord. And so that's, that's the way that it ought to be. When God blesses us, we turn around and uh, use it uh, in the Lord's work. Uh, think about uh, Solomon in Ecclesiastes and uh, the things that he wrote after at the end of his life and he saw really what the world was all about. He says, what, hath a, what profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? For what, what hath man of all his labor and of the vexation of his heart wherein he hath labored under the sun? He's saying, it's, what's, what is it? It's nothing. It's nothing. And of course, we know that what, we have, what you have here, you can't take with you. Uh, it's not going to go with you to the afterlife. Um, Everything's going to be left behind. Uh, I've seen a couple of times you see these big RVs going down the road, those three and four hundred thousand dollar rigs, you know, the kind I just kind of drool over. Um, I've gone in a couple of them. They're nice. Uh, now, if I sold my house, sold my cars, sold the dog, I might could make a down payment. <laughs> you just. You, but it's funny. I've seen stickers on them, spending our kids' retirement. They're spending it. They're not going to give it to their kids. Um, Psalm 17, 14. For men which are thy hand, O Lord, for men of the world which have their portion in this life, whose belly thou fillest with thy hid treasure, they are full of children and leave the rest of their substance to their babes. He's saying you're not going to take it with you. It's going to be left behind. And from what I, honestly, what I've seen in some families, it would have been better if they took it with them because it can split, it can split families uh, when you start trying to figure out the inheritance and who gets what. And uh, when you get, bring money into it, um, it really can get in a mess. But Solomon, the wisest man in the world, this is what he said in Ecclesiastes 5. He says, there is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun, namely riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. But those riches perish by evil travail, and he begetteth a son, and there is nothing in his hand. As he came forth of his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came, and shall take nothing of his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. So the world is vain. It's vain. Uh, but when we think about the, the value of a soul, think about the, the, the cost of a lost soul. In Revelation 20, 12, probably to me one of the, the most solemn passages in Scripture, says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. This is going to be the final judgment of lost souls and the price that they have to pay. Down in verse 20, 15 it says, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now I've had that word cast explained to me that that is a, a very strong term like you would pick something up and throw it, that they literally will be cast into this lake of fire. And realize that's, that's a loss that can't be replaced. You cannot replace that. Uh, for someone to die and spend all eternity in the lake of fire, what, what's, what you're going to replace that with? There's no, there's no way out. The only hope an individual has is him to make the right decision before his heart stops, and he takes his last breath. Uh, it's, it's a very, very costly uh, thing. Matthew 16, 26, For what is a man profited, if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Just think about the value. All the kingdoms of the world, all the money, all the possessions, everything you can think of. 
pile that all together, and it doesn't even come close to the value of one soul. Not at all. It's a loss that, that really cannot be excused. Man's without excuse. God's done everything he can for man to be saved. He's given us his written word, which gives us the plan of salvation, has the gospel, tells us about the Savior. We have got the Son of God himself who came and, and gave himself for us. The Holy Spirit that draws men to God. All of these things that, that God has given us. He's given us preachers who given their lives to preaching God's word. And Jesus said there as he was coming into Jerusalem, if, if the people there were to remain quiet, he said even the rocks would cry out uh, to get the message out. Uh, all of these things God has done for us so that a soul could be saved. And there's nothing that can replace uh, the cost of that soul. And the thing is, with all that God's done, and I've, I've had discussions, people have tried to ask me this, if, you know, they'll try to pick at the Bible. Well, you know, if a man has never heard, why does God condemn him? Well, because Paul tells us in chapter 2 of Romans that the Gentiles have the law written in their heart. And they know right from wrong. And so everyone is without excuse. Uh, there is no excuse for not being saved. But then last, let's look at the value of serving God. Uh, someone who tries to save their own soul is going to lose it. Uh, you cannot, we cannot work our way to heaven. There's nothing that we can do on our own. Uh, if right now any one of us from right now on lived a perfect life, what do you do with all those other years? You can never make up for it. If you lived your whole life and only had one sin, you couldn't do anything to make up for it. It's all been paid for. You must accept God's way, God's payment for a soul. Of course, we're all familiar with Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, Galatians 2, 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by works of the law, for the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So really, we've got a choice. You know, we can live for ourselves, or we can accept God's plan, His payment for our soul, and then we can live and serve Him. Uh, Jesus talking in Matthew 6 says that we're not to lay up treasures in heaven. Because where your treasure is, that's, that's what you're going to be thinking about. That's what you're going to think about all the time is, you know, um, am I getting the interest I ought to be getting? And all of these things where you just learn to trust God and allow him to take care of you. Because I tell you, these missionaries that are coming, uh, it's, a, it's a very, I'd say, special lifestyle living by faith. Uh, not knowing, honestly, sometimes where your next meal's coming from, but then seeing God provide and God bless. And our son still t says to this day that the two years we were on deputation uh, did a tremendous job of building his faith, seeing how God blessed. Um, one episode that does stick out in my mind, we were in, uh, went to Connecticut. It was... Uh, you know, a preacher about my age that uh, graduated when I did from Bible college. We were with him for a week. He was really struggling. Uh, the ch big Catholic church down the street, they were doing all kinds of stuff to disturb him and everything. But anyway, you know, there in the trailer, well, let me step back. We had a meeting in New Jersey. I set aside the gas money that I thought I would need to get Connecticut and I had just enough food. I went then, it was back at an A&P food store. I bought some flour for biscuits, and I bought some bologna. And that's what we had to eat. It's good eating. I, I enjoy it. Too. I still enjoy that today. But, 
But anyway, when we got there to that church, basically the cupboard was bare. And the last service, I, we had pastored, said amen, and I started to walk down off the platform. And he says, hang on just a minute. And he had the family come up. They opened the back doors. And here come sacks and sacks of groceries. And the kids went through that, and they says, look, it's Jif. It's real peanut butter. <laughs> you know, I know some of you remember back when they first started having generic, they had a yellow label. And that was the trimmings from the other stuff. But uh, God provided for us. And that's these missionaries, they, they live by faith. Uh, I tell you, it's a good life. Uh, really, it is uh, to see what the Lord will do. But uh, when we, you know, surrender to his will, um, he says, I'll take care of you. And I, we go out, you know, and the, these missionaries that are going out, they're going out all over the world. Uh, seeking souls. Uh, we do that down at the brig and over at the nuclear power school. Uh, a lot of those men at the brig have gotten saved, um, gone on to, to serve the Lord. Unfortunately, I can't hear from them anymore. Uh, once they leave, there's to be no more contact, but uh, some of them have been back and they're, they're very happy and found them a church. They've gotten married, having kids, and just, you know, still serving the Lord. And that, uh, that means a lot uh, to find out that, you know, they're, still, they're still, on the, still going. So what is the value of a soul? It's the most valuable thing in the world. Christ died for it. He died for each and every soul. You think about all the people who have ever lived, all of those who will be born until his, uh, his return in the rapture, uh, paid for every single one of them. And it's up to man to accept that payment. Uh, there is no other payment. Nothing. Nothing else can secure your soul but the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. That's the answer. And that is the value of a soul. Is what it costs our Lord. You know, and when, when Christ hung on the cross and he, he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He and the Father had been together for all eternity, never separated. But for three hours on that cross, his Father rejected him. And think about in that three hours, what he went through paid for all our sin. It is a very, very valuable commodity. And we need to realize that. And I just ask about the way we act, the way, what we do. What value do we place on a soul? Do we have the same, claim the same value that the Lord does? Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for